Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2021 Connect Conference Day 3, brought to you by Huawei Antron and Dr. Street Partner CBRE. Enjoy the next session. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Connect Conference 2021. Um, I know that I keep saying this, but um, we're incredibly fortunate to have some of the greatest mind in the sector um, joining us on this platform, sharing their knowledge and expertise and um, giving the sector some guidance. Um, as an industry association, it's incredibly important for us to have dialogue um, in the sector, uh, to talk about you know, what's happening in the sector, where we're going to, um, and to find a, a way in which we can regulate ourselves um, in spite of the fact that, you know, there are some regulation out there, but we also know that we have to develop our own methods to steer our sector and our industry to create growth um, and to stimulate uh, demand in these areas. So today I'm incredibly excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, she actually needs very little introduction. Um, most of us know her. Um, she's synonymous with the data center world. Um, she's uh, one of the disruptors or seen as, as uh, one of the, the greater disruptor, disruptors in our, in our market and um, certainly, um, you know, had many um, words attached to herself um, and, um, you know, that all speaks to innovation and, um, you know, a great mind that have certainly turned the way that we looked at data centers um, from a South Africa and Africa point of view um, around. So um, without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker, Michelle McCann. She's the head of interconnection and peering at Terraco and NAP Africa. Um, Michelle is a key member of the Terraco team, and um, she was responsible as part of the team for the uh, development and growth of the NAP, NAP Africa Internet Exchange um, into the largest IXP in Africa, focused on servicing sub-Saharan Africa. Michelle um, is passionate, as you're going to hear this morning, um, about peering uh, content and carrier aggregation in Africa. Um, and she's got a key understanding of the opportunities and challenges within the African market. Um, and she's very experienced um, in diversification for the global market. So, but prior to, to her career, Terraco, um, Michelle served as commercial director at Arc Telecoms. Her role there was um, to develop uh, new infrastructures, focusing on, on ISP products and services to the market. Um, currently, one of the key strategic focus areas is on stakeholder development with new and existing Terraco carriers and content providers to grow future opportunities locally and internationally for the company. Welcome, Michelle. It's a, it's a great privilege to have you with us. Um, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Um, and uh, your yeah, interesting topic, um, the uh, of looking at Africa's online uh, evolution. Um, and you're going to have a particular focus this morning um, on uh, investment. Um, welcome. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing this knowledge with us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Janita. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> That's quite an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me just open up my slides so that everyone can have a view. Perfect. So as uh, Janita has um, alluded to this morning, I'm going to go through Africa's online evolution. Um, obviously, as a very high level, because we don't have a much enough time to to kind of go through all the details. But please feel free to reach out if you have any particular questions or any suggestions. Cool, so Africa is a land of opportunity. Um, we've, we've had an extent, as you know, we have an extensive population, large land mass and potential for massive growth. As we've seen with large scale investments in infrastructure such as data center, subsea cables and terrestrial fiber. Africa is getting online. So if we look at over especially the last year and what's been happening, the global internet bandwidth rose last year by 35%, which is a substant substantial increase over the previous year's modest 26%. This is largely driven by the response to COVID-19 pandemic and represents the largest increase since 2013. 
The total international bandwidth now stands at 618 terabits per second. Africa, however, experienced the most rapid growth internationally, where we saw an annual growth of over 47 percent, um, which we've never seen before. And I'm sure you can all attest to how we're all working online and as we're forming this sort of thing online, it's, it's online has become a reality and the world of the Internet has become more and more important. So we're a mobile economy, as we know, and we see the extensive investment that's happening locally here with the likes of Vodacom, MTN, Celsi, Telcom, etc. So we're seeing huge mobile penetration rates which we'll only see grow as we see more and more of these operators start moving into those rural areas, which is kind of the untouched market. Um, and hopefully we very excited of this as a Terico because more people that go online, they're able to obviously consume more internet um, bandwidth and get access to key content and cloud applications um, to be able to run their day-to-day -day lives. Um, as mentioned before, online and internet has become a key, key necessity for, for every human. So last mile investment growth. Um, we've definitely, COVID hasn't slowed this one down at all. <laughs> so, um, and thanks thanks to a lot of support, especially within within this community, that investment has been able to continue over the, over the last year. So we're seeing a lot more happening around the terrestrial backbone, uh, fiber infrastructure. And what's meant by that is that cross-border connectivity between various African countries. Um, previously, that used to kind of um, not be, be the key aspect that people would focus on, but you're starting to see uh, big organizations like a Liquid and an MTN start investing in cross-bordering. And what that allows is easy transactions between those various uh, countries rather than us having to go all the way to Europe and back again into our countries, which obviously adds costs and adds a lot of latency onto that. Um, fiber to the home, I mean, that's just been a massive boom. And uh, we're all seeing it now. I never thought I would see the day where I actually have a fiber connection in my house. And today I do, and uh, I wouldn't know how to operate without that. Um, we've seen in terms of the, the online users and remote users, and how the hybrid workplace is going to be driving this investment more and more. Satellite, uh, there's been a huge amount of um, development around this, but some exciting innovation with the likes of Starlink, who've announced that they will be available in South Africa and hopefully obviously through the rest of Africa, which then also helps drive that how do I get to the remote environments to be able to allow those users to access key content and cloud. Spectrum, as we know, is an ongoing debate, um, which I'm sure will be resolved. And funny enough, not only happening in Africa, but obviously all happening all across the world. That's something that that everyone's trying to solve at the moment. But uh, once once the, the regulators have been able to resolve this, I think we're going to see exciting rollouts with 5G, et cetera, starting to, to hit the market, allowing for higher capacities for that mobile market. Data center investment has just boomed in Africa. Um, we're seeing obviously with ourselves um, and uh, Africa data centers and uh, Icolo, et cetera, starting to roll out data center infrastructure throughout Africa. So uh, you're starting to see those key hubs develop. So the way we see, see Africa is very much because obviously there's a lot of countries in Africa. So we see these key hubs starting to develop. So South Africa becoming a key hub for that Southern African region, Kenya becoming a key hub for that East African region, and Nigeria becoming that key hub for the West African region. At the moment, all eyes are on for North Africa on Egypt, um, but right now a lot of that traffic is being served from Europe, being places like Marseille, et cetera. Um, but hopefully Egypt as it grows, will become that North African key hub. So to give an idea of our investments, and I never thought I would see these kinds of numbers, you know, being at Terraco for 10 years now, um, but we've got over 100 megawatt investment happening in just South Africa alone. And uh, if you look at the scale of our, specifically our Johannesburg facilities, 
um, and the new site that's even being built and will go live um, early next year, you're looking at, you know, over 100 megawatts just in Johannesburg alone. And what we've seen, which is quite exciting, and Johannesburg makes sense as a hub because it's very high GDP. Um, a lot of it's, it's located very strategically to serve those various countries um, next to us, be it of Swaziland, Lesotho, Namibia, etc. But uh, we're starting to see Cape Town emerge at, as quite a key hub. So we've just recently launched our new data center in Cape Town, um, Brackenfell. And that's a 30 megawatt site with more room to expand as well. And we see that Cape Town becoming that key interconnection hub, similarly to Joburg, and the two being resilient to each other. And then Durban, Durban may seem small, but incredibly strategic. Um, Durban has, uh, what's recently just happened is the, the Metis cable has landed in our Durban facility. And that's the cable linking South Africa back to Mauritius, Reunion, Madagascar. Um, for them to be able to access the key content and key content being what you and I use on a daily basis, be it Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Facebook, etc. Um, they are now able to access that at a shorter latency by, by connecting to South Africa rather than once again going all the way to Europe and back again. So to give you an idea, it's um, and everybody, please, if you want to come for a tour, happy reach out, reach out, and we can take you for a tour of the facilities. But you'll see here on the kind of right hand side was the original Terraco in uh, Johannesburg, and then we expanded to to Terraco West, which we thought, you know, that's 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 a big enough building and that's going to cope for enough time. And we were wrong. We had to expand to Joburg 3. So Joburg 3 is now live. Um, incredible investment that we've seen happen in Africa. And as I've mentioned, I don't think we would have ever seen something like this happen here on our own shores. You know, I normally travel a lot to, to Europe and the States and you see these kinds of facilities overseas. And, you know, sort of looking 10 years ago, I kind of would have thought this is never going to happen in Africa, you know. <laughs> And now looking today, we're seeing this, this large scale investment um, coming into the into our shores. If you look at Cape Town, so funny enough, Terrico actually started in Cape Town um, and uh, we've seen this site grow extensively in terms of that interconnection and, and peering strategy to such an extent that we've had to build the new site. And uh, obviously, as I mentioned, Durban, still small but very strategic that we're actually going to be expanding Durban very soon. So to give you an idea of the, the Cape Town expansion in Brackenfell, these are some of the, the actual uh, pictures while they were busy building it and um, uh, it's just massive. <laughs> so if you'll see the amount of chillers on the roof, um, the amount of uh, space that's required to build these kinds of DCs and uh, be able to power them all up. So fantastic investment happening in, in Cape Town and one of the, the largest data center investments happening in Cape Town at the moment. So I suppose we all ask the question, why, why these large scale in data centers, you know, because for us, we only sell the actual data center footprint itself. So if you think of us, we, we're pretty much a landlord um, to various companies to actually put their hardware in our, in our facilities. And um, it's driven primarily by a lot of international investment from large content and cloud operators, um, which has been happening over a number of years. Um, it's not something that's just magically happened in the last year. It's been something that's been happening over, you know, kind of if I look back the last eight years, there's been a lot of these large content and cloud providers who've said, you know, hey, we can see the opportunity in Africa. It may not be right now, but let's take that risk and invest and, and start getting uh, the African nation to access our, our content at a lower latency. So with these guys investing, we've actually started to see a number of network providers be able to emerge because now it's not just um, how do I reach Europe to be able to access the content, it's now this content is here locally and how can I create my own ISP to be able to service my own community? So interconnection and peering has been a, a key driver to this. 
And fundamentally, what we're seeing today is actually more and more enterprises and financial institutes are starting to see the benefit of this interconnection and peering strategies happening. So they're coming into, let's say, Aterico and saying, hang on, I can now connect to my network service provider, I can connect to my cloud provider, I can connect to my key content provider, and I can connect to my third party suppliers all within one single deployment, which therefore makes a, their lives obviously a lot more easier from, a, from an ongoing operations perspective, and it reduces costs dramatically. So, so we're starting to see that market actually start moving in and, and peering. Um, if you look at, let's say, NAP Africa versus a international exchange like a Lynx, an Amsix, or a DKIX, we have a huge amount of enterprises who are taking that step and, and going out there and starting to peer at internet exchanges. So to demonstrate the interconnection growth, and this number, I can never catch up with it. Every time I do the slide, I need to redo it. But you'll see 2018, we we're sitting at 11,000 interconnects, and today we're actually sitting at 22,000 interconnects. Um, and that's just growing at over 300 new interconnects a month. And as mentioned, it's enterprise connecting to enterprise, it's, it's carrier connecting to content, outsources starting to connect to, to content and cloud. So it's this huge ecosystem of interconnection that's starting to emerge um, due to the ease of being able to, to transact with each other within a single facility. Subsea cable growth has been phenomenal over the last couple of years. I mean, I just I remember the days when we kind of all just had really sat three and safe, um, leaving our shores. And uh, now if you look at the list of undersea cables that have come in and, and landed, and I mean, a lot of you who operate subsea cables will understand the investment is not small. I mean, this is a huge amount of investment that's happened here. Um, so that's in terms of allowing access from South Africa, for example, out to the rest of the world um, and the rest of the world back into Africa as well. We are also seeing two major investments that are going to hit our shores pretty soon. One is the Equiano cable, which is mainly the Google guys, and then the Two Africa Consortium. Um, a lot of these will be bringing a lot more capacity as well as additional landing stations. So you'll see something in terms of this map that I'm demonstrating here is a lot of countries only have a single landing station. So the problem that has is if something happens on in that particular landing station or or that site, that country effectively is down in terms of subsea cable capacity. So you'll see with these investments having multiple landing sites, not only obviously drives down costs, it also adds redundancy um, in terms of subsea cable infrastructure. Why has public cloud done their investment? I mean, we've seen all the big hyperscalers coming through to our shores. Um, and why has this investment effectively happened? And as I alluded to, we kind of see these hubs happening in Africa, be it South Africa for the Southern, Kenya for the East, and Nigeria for the Western region. And the way we kind of look at it is there's a sort of imaginary latency line, which is running from Nigeria kind of all the way through to, to Kenya and below that. And if you look at the market share and, and the ability for these large cloud providers to be able to service multiple countries um, from a single deployment, and, and a single deployment in a country is not small. I mean, they, they invest megawatts in terms of their, their, their cloud infrastructure. So, so one of the things that they look at is, A, where can I put this to be able to service these multiple markets? Um, B, in terms of stable infrastructure. So, I mean, a lot of us may or may not believe it, but uh, South Africa does have really stable power infrastructure. Um, uh, access to a huge amount of network operators. And if you look at South Africa with our, our favorable uh, regulatory environment, you know, it's very easy for people to be able to be an ISP and easily trade. I mean, that's why we have over 250 ISPs or carriers within our market and a very stable political and economic climate. So South Africa kind of kicks all of these, these tick boxes 
And then another key thing is <laughs> what I kind of look at is if you look at South Africa versus Europe, we're the furthest point away. So mm -hmm. if you're wanting to, let's say, access content in Europe, you're going to be sitting at, you know, 150, 160 milliseconds of latency. Whereas if that content is local, you're sitting at milliseconds of latency to be able to access those uh, that content that's here local. The other thing is around um, if you look at our top 250 companies in, in Africa, you'll see South Africa has a huge amount of GDP. So for these, these cloud and content providers, who they can actually service um, is quite key. And you'll see in terms of the list, South Africa has a huge amount of these top companies based by market cap uh, located here. So latency does make a difference. And I've harped on this quite a bit, but what we did was interestingly enough, when Microsoft went live and those of you who know myself and the rest of the team, we quite a curious bunch. So we wanted to really test what was the latency difference. And effectively what we did was we turned up resources into, into West Europe on Microsoft and we turned up resources in Johannesburg to, to test the latency and see what the difference is. And um, we achieved in Europe, it was 171 milliseconds versus here in Joburg, which was less than two milliseconds. So you can see how cloud and cloud having this local region here effectively does make cloud and cloud strategies a reality where you're not sitting with this massive uh, latency difference um, you're now sitting with it right on your shores to be able to start implementing key, key cloud strategies for your own business. Uh, cloud exchanges are emerging. So a cloud exchange is effectively, if I can describe it, it's the on-ramp to be able to reach the various cloud operators. And cloud exchanges have been, you know, available in Europe and the States and Asia for, for many years. And uh, we've actually just recently launched our cloud exchange, which allows you the ability to easily connect to your Microsofts and your Amazons and now Huawei as well. And uh, we, over the last year, we saw an incredible amount of adoption on this. We saw over 48% growth. And this year it hasn't stopped. It's, it's an ongoing, people are wanting to be able to access that cloud. Um, the key driver around it, funny enough, was speaking to a number of, of clients was, you know, they didn't realize the impact of COVID. And suddenly, as if you think of me as like an IT manager, is I have a data center which is sitting in my building or a server room in my building, and it was fine and it was operating for many, many years. But now that building becomes the risk because people are obviously coming in and out of that. And how do I quickly create a DR type solution without having to do a huge capital investment. And cloud is the answer to that. And that's why we've seen a huge amount of cloud interconnection happening is, is these organizations saying, here's the cloud, here's a way for me to resolve A, the, my short-term issue with B, having a view into a long-term goal of migrating into the cloud. In terms of internet exchanges, um, Africa has been fantastic in terms of growth. I mean, 10 years ago, we had, you know, just a handful of internet exchanges um, running across, you know, the, the countries. Now, as you see, we've got over 34 countries that have active internet exchanges, um, which then allows easy access for these content providers to be able to invest in a country and distribute their content to uh, the various network operators, which then service you and me on the ground when I'm wanting to access my key applications. So an interesting story around uh, what happened in the last year, and you can you probably can't see it, but I've got a couple of more gray hairs for it, but um, we saw a huge amount of traffic growth. So to give you an idea, it took us eight years to get NAP Africa to a terabit per second of peering capacity. And within one year, we have doubled that to over two terabits of peering capacity. So it shows you that this internet adoption has happened and it's happening and it's ongoingly happening where 
where users have realized that, hang on, internet access is not a luxury anymore. It's actually now a requirement for, for them to be able to live their lives and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So as Forbes magazine say, Africa is the next frontier for the internet. I kind of say there's still a lot more work to be done. <laughs> so it's not it's not ready for us to sit back and, and enjoy all the, you know, all the stuff that we put in place. But effectively, there's there's still a huge lack in terms of last mile connectivity that needs to happen across Africa. And it's happening, which is fantastic to see. Um, the ability to be able to service those rural communities is kind of needing to happen. And uh, once again, we are starting to see that happen and starting to see access to more cloud. Um, we've seen some of the large hyperscalers come in, but there's some key applications that are still only accessible from Europe, which um, hopefully soon will be able to be accessible here locally. So that's that's kind of my my overview today. Um, please reach out, as mentioned, if you've got any questions, any suggestions. There's a lot more research behind this. I just kind of had to summarize it based on our timing, but happy to share. And you're welcome to come through for a data center tour. Just reach out to me. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. That's um, that's yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, I, I was listening to you doing this, and I and and I, I, I'm like, there's one thing that's sort of stuck in my mind now, and I wish it was like a more technical uh, question, but you know, being the person that I am, um, you know, it, you won't be surprised by what I'm about to ask. But you know, you've been there since the very beginning. Um, I'm quite curious to ask you how insane this this ride has been you know you said a couple of times we never saw this you never saw this you know um i remember meeting with dfa when they were just a startup you know now i mean they they employing through the group uh, thousands of people you know we saw this 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 growth and i know that i sometimes stand there and i go like what how, did, how what was that like for you to like and how what was the phases that you went through and and do you still like some days go like this can't be real? <laughs> I think every day I go this can't be real. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's it's been it's been a fantastic journey, uh, not only just for myself for the whole team. I mean I remember, you know, sort of going overseas especially and and trying to educate global content and cloud people around Africa, <laughs> and. And it's amazing when you look back at presentations we did kind of 10 years ago to today, it's, it's chalk and cheese. But, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, discussions that happened then, and, you know, I mean, the, the, global, the global guys have a lot more knowledge and obviously experience, and it was a lot of learning that we had to, to take from them, and I thank them every day. I mean, that community is just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we wouldn't be here today if it, if it wasn't for them. And uh, the learning that we took from there and implementing it here locally has been has been a phenomenal journey. Um, it, it really has, and I'm looking forward to it. I mean, there's exciting things like the cloud exchange. I mean, we never, I mean, I know Andrew and myself have been talking about cloud exchanges probably for five years now, but to actually see it in reality, you know, and seeing that companies are coming and saying, hey, how do I connect to Microsoft, Amazon or Huawei? And, this is my strategy and this is how I want to move to the cloud and hearing those discussions is just completely amazing. So, you know, as you, you're starting this whole other journey that's that's going around in terms of cloud adoption and it's very exciting to see. Yeah, yeah I feel like, I feel exactly the same, you know, and people continue to surprise us. You know, we like I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, when we started after those early days as, you know, just lobbying for fiber and trying to get everybody to understand fiber. I mean, we didn't, we also didn't think we were going to see fiber to the home. We hoped we would, we hoped we would, but, but, you know, that was the goal. 
but you know, you you get like people are like, oh, don't be crazy. This is the mobile continent. We never gonna. We don't need this. What are we gonna do with it? You know, they you've got all these arguments, and and here we are today, and now we're talking about connecting the next six million to fiber, and you know, we the market originally was a million people, and you know, it's just kept growing and the demand um, and, you know, the affordability, you know, so much, uh, so much better. And, um, and certainly, but yeah, I just want to congratulate you guys. You know, you've done such a phenomenal job. Um, you know, you've uh, the, just the job creation and, um, you know, the economic development uh, that a company like Terraco has uh, made possible um, in South Africa is really phenomenal. I don't think we, we recognize that um, enough. So uh, congratulations to you and the whole team. Um, and um, I look forward to um, being in the in the sort of uh, coattails of your journey and watching this. And um, yeah, thank you for your time today. It's uh, been incredibly interesting. So, yeah, have a wonderful day further. And um, thank you for sharing your time. Thank you, Janita. Thank you, you too. Ladies and gentlemen, we trust you enjoyed the session. Thank you to all our sponsors and partners for helping us bring this event to you. Please click on the next link to join the following session.